This video is brought to you by Summoner's War. Check out Summoner's War's first ever collaboration. Summoner's War in Street Fighter V features Ryu, Chun-Li, Dalsham, M. Bison, and Ken. Summoner's War is the world's top mobile turn-based RPG with over 110 million downloads on the Google Play and App Store. The game is ever-evolving, constantly updated, awesome new features, and new characters for you to play. There are over 1,000 different monsters for you collectionists out there to try to collect. It has a global community on a huge scale, as well as being one of the most successful mobile esports games. Summoner's War is also celebrating the Street Fighter collaboration with an augmented reality filter event on social media and in-game events. Go download Summoner's War in the description below and summon your free Ken now! League of Legends always changes. There's constant updates, new patches, adjustments to balance, and an ever-evolving metagame. The philosophy that Riot has taken over the years for balancing this game is a very hands-on approach. When things are weak, they look to buff them. And when things are strong, for the most part, they do try to nerf them. They quickly take matters into the hands of the developers and completely rework outdated champion kits and try to update things that feel old and try to make them fresh. This approach does its job decently well, but as you probably know, not every player is happy with the League of Legends balance team all the time. WHAT ARE THEY DOING?! HOW DID IT EVEN MAKE IT TO LIVE SERVERS?! The hands-on approach that League of Legends takes for their balance is not the only way that you can do it. Something seen more commonly for fighting games like Melee, and real-time strategy games like Age of Empires 2. Rather than constantly updating the game directly from the developers every two weeks, you can leave it all in the hands of the players. The argument for not changing the game so often is that over time players will naturally change the meta on their own, they will optimize new strategies once thought to be terrible, and eventually the players will outsmart the overpowered techniques and find a way to beat the meta one way or the other. A couple of years ago, a video was made by none other than Doublelift about this very topic, and he provides some strong evidence for why less is more when it comes to balancing the game. From the perspective of a professional player, I can only imagine how frustrating it must be to have your competitive career changed every two weeks. But one thing about constant change, and as Doublelift did point out, by buffing what's weak instead of nerfing what's strong, it allows new strategies that once had no place whatsoever to eventually find a home. Champions that used to be a complete mess in this game, undertuned and underwhelming, can now shine brighter than ever five years later. When I think of champions that have written a comeback story for themselves, one that used to be a complete dumpster fire train wreck and now being quite strong, I think of none other than Bard. It's a fascinating story to see him go from one of the worst champions all time back in 2015 to now in 2020 being one of the best champions in professional play. When you think of all of the wacky and unique champions in League of Legends, Bard might be right at the top of your list and his history is just as cool as he is. If you haven't been watching professional play here in Season 10, you may not know that Bard is one of the top tier picks for support. Players like Lu Mao in the LPL and Barrel in the LCK have racked up some amazing Bard performances this year. Lu Mao has played him 14 times with an 85% win rate, and Barrel has played him 11 times with a 72% win rate. And plenty of other professional players around the world have hopped on the Bard train, and he's even received a couple of nerfs. So, how did we get here? If Rush has to say this about Bard and Bard mains... Everyone hates Bard mains. Even their parents don't like Bard mains. Why on earth is he good now? What has made this former troll pick become a top tier meta support? The development story of Bard begins a long time ago, years before his actual release even. You see, during the very early years of League of Legends, the jungle role itself was primitive in terms of strategy. Being a jungler was so difficult, and it was often thought to be suboptimal compared to just having another duo lane in the top lane. 
Players would learn that clearing the jungle and farming the camps was hard, but ganking was easy. If you factor in that there were gold generating and income items that stacked with each other, such as the Philosopher's Stone and the Heart of Gold, you can start to see why a roaming jungler playstyle became a thing, all centered around one thing, gank the enemy and tilt them. Of all of the champions in the game that did this, the one that everyone remembers from that time was Jungle Alistar. He was a supportive champion with an unbeatable combo of crowd control, so after just some basic jungle clearing to buy those income items, it was time to start ganking. Your entire job as Jungle Alistar was to make the enemy team hate you. If the enemy wasn't typing in all chat GG Alistar permaganks jungle diff, well, it was probably because people didn't really type like that 10 years ago, but also because you didn't gank enough. He was a total beast for both ranked and competitive play, which led to him being nerfed. If you fast forward a couple of years to 2015, Jungle Alistar had been out of the meta for quite a while. But then, Riot saw an interesting opportunity for a new champion. Rabid Llama was the main designer for Bard, and one day him and the boys at Riot thought to themselves that the idea of Jungle Alistar and a roaming ganker was really cool, but the income items and his undodgeable combo made it hard to balance. So what if we designed a champion specifically around that idea? A roaming support. The clear problem that had to be tackled here is how can you design a champion around map movement and roaming playstyles given the way that League of Legends works with the lanes and the jungle camps? Because if you're not in lane killing minions or soaking the experience, and if you're not the jungler and killing the camps, you will fall behind in experience and gold. You'll need some kind of reward other than kills if the champion is supposed to leave the lane. If they were to make a champion like this, there would have to be some kind of incentive to move around the map. And that's where Bard's Chimes come in. These Chimes, and to some extent the Healing Shrines, act as a way for the Bard player to be rewarded to move around the map and make some plays. His passive is more interesting than just a gimmick. It adds to the theme and the feel of the champ. Of course, sacrifices had to be made to ensure that he wouldn't just win the game instantly with unstoppable ganks. Both of his main crowd control and disabling effects, his Q and his ultimate, are quite hard to land. Additionally, he was only given damage on his Q and his passive, so if you don't land any skill shot Qs, well, all Bard can do for damage is auto attack. Note, that will be a factor after his release. Turns out, Bard is hard, people are bad. Wow, that thing is so slow. What? Oh, I say glass of the clock. Is that me? Fuck! Wait. Wait. For a champion to be roaming around the rift, how Riot would give the kit mobility ended up being a lot more interesting than just some kind of basic dash or jump. Magical Journey could have been only accessible by Bard, or Bard and his allies, but the fact that everyone, including enemies, can use it just goes to show how unique this champion was and how it was meant to be different. Bard's ultimate is Tempered Fate, and it's one of the coolest abilities in the whole game, but at the same time, it's still one of the most unforgiving things to use. Because of its range and AoE, it can win you the game single-handedly by setting up a pick and catching someone out but it can also troll your team pretty hard. Speaker lands the javelin. They land. Oh, that is a that is a troll ult. He's going to kill himself before what? the fight. Biofrost, who are you working for? The theme that was finalized with Bard was a cosmic entity, somewhat of a mysterious figure in the lore, and he's not very well understood by the Rune Terrans. Early on in his development though, Bard was a literal bard. Whether he took on more of a human theme, or if he still wore some kind of mask, we're not entirely sure. Celtic bards were poets or musicians dedicated to storytelling and adventure. Often they would travel the lands playing music or were hired by patrons. This is why they most commonly dressed in cloth or light leather and had a musical instrument handy for storytelling and singing. Despite an eventual theme change to this cosmic being, his weapon as a flute is reminiscent of his original design. His storytelling is reflected by how Bard's main goal is to preserve the history of Runeterra. 
Bards from real life were typically depicted as nomads and pacifists, a perfect fit for a champion that wasn't always meant to be in lane, slaughtering minions and killing enemies. He becomes stronger through song and traveling. On March 5th of 2015, the teaser for League's newest champion, Bard, was released. The teaser starts off with an invasion of a village that has an ancient stone, which the bad guys apparently want. It shows Bard saving the stone from being misused, which would presumably destroy the universe. But interestingly, he doesn't help the villagers who are dying. At the end, he escapes back into the cosmos with the stone saving the universe, but not the town. People who follow the lore have made some sense of it. Bard's job is to keep the universe from falling apart and being destroyed. It's not about saving the villagers, who in the grand scheme of things, don't really have the same level of importance as the entire world. In other words, Bard's a busy man. This trailer is one of Riot's most successful ones ever, with over 5 million views on YouTube. The hype surrounding Bard's release at the time is one of the biggest that I can remember. A new support, which is something that back in 2015 we hadn't seen for a while, a completely new style of champion with a pretty high skill cap, and a sweet release skin which kickstarted the Elderwood skin line. So what could go wrong? As it turns out, everything could go wrong and the, the space where you land on it and you give all your stars to the other player, that's Bard. Bard's actually not that bad. He's strong if you build shut the f up. You know he's bad. I know he's bad. Let's be honest here. We all know this guy is pretty bad. In this game, 99% of the time, brand new champions are either really overpowered or very weak, and there's kind of a good reason for that. When they release new champions, they're often overpowered or overtuned to make up for the fact that they're supposed to be kind of hard to play. Sometimes they intentionally give a champion high numbers and overloaded abilities, and over time they end up having their numbers tuned down and parts of their kit removed. When release champions are terrible, they end up usually being over nerfed as compensation for how good their kit really is. Riot knew that Yumi had really strong abilities, and because of that her release state had pathetic numbers and stats, but Yumi also suffered the same thing that every single new champion deals with, a big learning curve. On release, Bard wasn't just your typical kind of bad, he was one of the worst champions of all time. Even several weeks after his release, he held a win rate somewhere in the 20 or 30% range. High mana cost, bad hitboxes, low numbers, and generally a poor quality of life all around the board on the champion made you question why you even picked him. He was clunky, awkward, and with a totally new playstyle, came a totally new learning curve. It was hard to figure out how much you're supposed to move around, because if you never leave the lane, you will never collect any chimes and stack up your passive. But if you spend far too much time roaming and collecting chimes, you leave your ADC trying to play a 1 versus 2 lane. Bard was released on patch 5.5, and over the next following three patches, he would be buffed. It's pretty common to see a new champion buffed on the next patch after their release if they're pretty undertuned, but in doing all of these videos over the years about champion histories, I don't know if I've ever seen a champion be buffed three straight times right after their release. For pretty much his whole history, there's been a stigma of Bard being a troll champ, or people who pick him are trolling. And a lot of this comes down to his wacky playstyle and his abilities are difficult to learn, but it all traces back to his release. With how bad he was, players knew that they were basically throwing the game away by picking him. And his ultimate is one of the few abilities in the game that allows you to affect your teammates directly and in sometimes a negative way. During this time, if you saw your support lock in Bard, you better believe they weren't expecting to win that game, and they were just trying to have some fun and learn a brand new champ. A part of these sets of buffs that I need to highlight is the quality of life changes. Probably the most important changes he received were targeted at making the champion smoother to play and easier to use. As previously mentioned, his clunkiness was a point of frustration for those trying him in his early days. Thankfully for our friend Bard, his time to chime wouldn't have to wait too long. With the aforementioned buffs and with multiple weeks and months of practice, players started to get in a groove. His win rate steadily increased throughout that year, which would lead to a huge breakthrough.
During the early part of 2015, the LPL was starting to make a name for itself. Edward Gaming had just shockingly upset SKT at the Midseason Invitational, which meant that all eyes were on China to be the strongest region in Professional League of Legends. Bard saw his very first competitive pick on April 3rd of 2015, where PYL, the support for LGD Gaming, locked in Bard. He would end up losing that game, but only 8 days later, he tried it again, and he got a win, becoming the very first player to also win a game on Bard. The first player to win on Bard in the LCS was Enemy's Body Drop, but one weekend later, a different support player would steal all of the spotlight. During the summer split, fan favorite and one of the all-time veterans of the game, Afromu, would have two amazing games of Bard in a row. Afromu finished the first game against Gravity with a score of 5 kills, 2 deaths, and 16 assists, and then followed it up with a score of 2 kills, 2 deaths, and 11 assists. This would be the very first time that most Western fans would be exposed to a Bard player who knew what they were doing. Uh, maybe like Dominate, he hasn't put, had time to put in too much too many games. Yeah, Echo, those right. 10 games. <laughs> Ooh, out of sight. See, there it is, Tempered Fatem! Oh, no, they're not gonna have to this time. <laughs> I was gonna say, that's the follow-up. That's what I was looking for. All of a sudden, the champion that everyone, and I mean everyone, thought was a complete troll pick was now a flavor of the month. And thanks to some great performances by Afromu, everybody was looking to try it out. His popularity began to spike overnight, and Riot even gave him some more buffs. On two straight patches, patch 5.16 and 5.17, they looked to carry the momentum of all of those buffs and all of the hype from Afromu into Worlds. So coming into 2016 with his flute held high, he reached some heights that we still haven't seen since. The launch of Season 6 changed the game drastically from all previous years of League of Legends. There was not only a support item rework, but the new Keystone Masteries caused a massive meta shift. But first, Bard would be buffed directly on patch 6.1. His passive was given an update to the 25 chime milestone, which just kind of increased the area around the target when you hit them, and that cone behind them became more consistent. The support item rework would end up being huge for mage supports as they saw an update to the Frost Queen's claim. It was given a brand new active, which today you guys will know as the Twin Shadows active, and this being put directly onto a support item that he already wanted was just another great tool for chasing down people and catching them in the jungle. As for those Keystone Masteries, one of them was so good that every single person in the game took it. Or some people argued that every other one was so bad, but you remember League of Thunderlords Decree. Even though 8, 9, or even 10 out of 10 players in-game would use this Keystone, Bard was one of the specific champions that benefited heavily from Thunderlords. In order to activate it, because Bard had the meeps on his auto-attacks, he could proc the mastery with just an auto-attack and a Q. His laning became one of, if not the best laning phase for all of the supports, and the damage helped his ganks and roams be even more successful. The ban raid history graph for Bard is kind of funny. As you can see during his entire life, he's never really been a high priority for bans, and he's always hovered around a 1-5% to ban rate. And then there's early 2016. His play rate also peaked during that time, and he's never been played as much as he was since those days. For the pro players during Season 6, guys like Team Liquid's Matt, Madlife, and Afromu became some of the best Bard players to watch. Out of all of the Bard players that season, Afromu would play him the most at the professional level with 29 lock-ins and a 58% win rate. One stat that surprised me is that TSM's Biofrost, yes the first time that he was their support back when he was a rookie, was undefeated in the 9 games that he played as Bard that year. With all of that success, it might sound like nerfing Bard would be inevitable, but he was never directly touched by Riot. Instead, they went for a more indirect route. They nerfed the Frost Queen's support item, and they nerfed Thunderlords. The two things that made him arguably the best support in the game were tuned down pretty substantially, and for the rest of the year, he was just an average tier support. Still played by those pros and solo queue players that loved him, but not seeing the level of dominance that he had at the beginning of the year, and towards the end of 2016, he slowly started to fade into obscurity.
Over the next two to three years, Bard's place in this game could really only be described as forgotten. His play rate and his popularity would consistently drop, and he reached his lowest ever pick rate around the summer of 2019. During that time, we saw some shiny new supports like Rakan and Pike, playmaking supports that wanted to carry their team, but those same players didn't really value Bard. If you weren't into those playmaking supports, then you probably were playing an Enchanter, and in 2017 we all remember the Ardent Sensor meta which completely took over the bottom lane and, truthfully, the whole map. While Bard does have a heal on his W to proc Ardent, clearly that was not a meta that he fit into because he wasn't Lulu or Janna. Instead, he was stuck in a weird spot where he wasn't really a mage support or a true playmaking support because champions like Zyra and Thresh were just doing his job a little bit better, and he wasn't an enchanter either as Janna and Lulu were dominating that role. Bard was just... Bard. Similar to when he first came out, he didn't really have a place in the game. He was this weird roaming support that every ADC player hated to lane with. Dog Bard equals <laughs> <laughs> Caitlyn walks through Try by herself instead of going around with Bard, which is stupid. And she gets cheesed for half her HP. Okay, so he's done playing now. Oh, she didn't like that! Oh, she didn't like that! She's already trolling anyway? Does it matter? This pissed her off! Yeah, she- I'm All of this reminds me of a quote by Becca Fitzpatrick. Sometimes bad things have to happen before good things can. Now, largely because Bard was completely irrelevant in the meta for quite a while, this meant that Bard players were forced to seek out the best optimization for him and his builds. Because the champion was at such a low point, it required all of the mains to get creative if they were going to find some success. In early Season 9, two players began popularizing Hail of Blades Bard, which at the time was a rune that not only sounded weird on a support, but in general nobody really took it even on carry champions back then. Lathyrus and Kalidino were two challenger players that used Hail of Blades as their go-to rune. As Kalidino pointed out in his guide, it was a hit-and-run playstyle, where the Hail of Blades would help proc the meeps, and then you just run away. Following that, in this year's preseason, Sleep Mods hit Challenger on Bard using an interesting set of items that no other support in League of Legends would ever think about building. Dead Man's Plate and Rapid Fire Cannon. These two items would come together along with Bard's passive to throw out a long range high damage auto attack that would chunk you and slow you. All of these items and runes are unconventional for standard support champions, but Bard's kit by itself is unconventional. To help him get through this long and drawn out meta that didn't favor his playstyle, they looked to help him with another round of buffs. He was buffed on patch 7.24, patch 8.10, patch 8.17, and patch 9.14. Pretty much every one of these buffs was really nice, but I think the most important was on 8.10, finally reducing the mana cost on Caretaker's Shrine. It's crazy that on his release it cost 100 mana, and all the way until 2018 it still cost 90 mana for one of the healing shrines. If you combine all of his new optimized builds, a couple of new rune choices, and even all of the previous buffs, a resurgence in 2020 was guaranteed. But we get to see it game five, Lou Mouse Bard. Lou Mouse Bard is iconic. He has to flash away as well. Stolen ulti from Knight as a cosmic fight. Jumps onto four. The bullet time set up. Two man knock up here. Onto Jackie Love. Onto 369. Can they find it? Because JDG may have found the miracle with Lou Mouse ulti. And that's exactly that. All of a sudden, back in the drivers. Gage comes through and for JDG this might be okay. Knight finds a two-man knock up here. The Tempered Fade again locks down Caster and Jackie Love. They're ready to jump in. JDG are up on top of esports. This is Caster getting knocked up as well. And once again, Lil Mouse says, this is my championship. It's all mine. Game 5 Bard showing in clutch.
In the summer split here in season 10, Bard's professional play presence is the highest it's ever been, at 48%. For the entire season, he's been picked 221 times in top 4 regions, and he's been banned 223 times. In terms of high elo solo queue, he has been dominant. Watching several challenger streams this year, I've heard players say that they forgot to ban Bard and Bard is broken, which is something that hasn't been said unironically for a very long time. The standard build these days has become Guardian as your keystone with an Athenes and a Redemption, but as stated multiple times, there's plenty of other options. Bard content creators have also been revived because the champion gets more popular by the day. Lathyrus, Kalidino, Fevinite, Polypuff, Sleopmots, and many others have become the faces of the Bard community, with Polypuff currently getting over 1 million views per month on YouTube. If you go to the Bard mains reddit, all of the types of streamers and content creators will be there, so you can find whoever you want to watch and learn from them if you're interested. Given his priority in professional play, and the fact that he was dominating solo queue, Bard nerfs for the first time ever became a real idea, a real possibility in this game. After approximately 16 buffs, 1 net neutral change, and 3 quality of life buffs since his release, after 1,820 days, he received his first ever nerf. On 10.5, his damage per 5 times was reduced from 12 to 15. On 10.9 and 10.16, he would be nerfed yet again. At the beginning of this year, he was a champion that had never been nerfed before, and now he's been hit 3 times in a row in less than 9 months. It's possible for Bard support to build AP heavy items like a Lich Bane and a Nasher's Tooth, but on hit Bard is an interesting build that's only ever been partially trolling. I can remember a time where Dyrus was playing quite a bit of Bard top lane. His laning phase isn't bad and he technically scales infinitely on his passive. I wouldn't recommend taking this into ranked anymore, but if you want a fun and different top laner to try out in normals with your friends and piss them off because you might feed, well on hit Bard with Nasher's Rapid Fire, Rage Blade, and Gunblade is kinda funny. During the entire history of Bard, he went from complete troll to top tier. Riot has admitted that his lack of popularity for a couple of years made them very hesitant to release any new skins for him, but we did see a new one this year with Astronaut Bard. His current state after the three nerfs in a row feels like he's right where he should be. Mastering him is extremely rewarding, and it's really cool to see just how good the Bard mains are at their favorite champion. Only time will tell if he's still slightly overtuned and he will have to be nerfed, but I feel like he'll still be in the meta for quite a while and is finally in a state where Bard main should be excited and happy, because for a couple of years there, it was pretty bad. Overall, he's one of the best designed champions in the game, without a doubt. He has diverse builds, a unique playstyle from any other champion, interesting lore, he's strong in solo queue and competitive play, he's a support that can do everything, and he doesn't feel extremely overwhelming to play against, at least not anymore after a couple of nerfs. The story of Bard makes us as League of Legends players remember one main thing. It has a lot of problems, and this game is far from perfect, but it also has one major upside. Because of how often Riot changes this game, metas will shift, power picks will move around, and no champion will stay terrible forever. It proves that even when Riot gets it so horrifically wrong at first, when picking a champion by default is soft inting, eventually, they will find their way to the top. Even though he's a champion without any real quotes, he still has quite the story to tell. Just please, bard players, don't do this to me. That That's all I ask. Anyway, I hope you all enjoyed. If you did and you want to support the production of these videos, the best way that you can do that is by giving it a like, subscribing, and leaving a comment for the algorithm to tell me that, hey, you enjoyed the video. If you did, like I said, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.